Christmas is here. It's in the air. Getting excited? Yeah, what a great, great time of the year. I, I think one of the traditions that we like so much is the singing, the music, all the music of Christmas. I think some radio stations started playing 24-hour you can just tune any one. There's several of them out there. Go to, go to any station. They're playing Christmas songs morning, noon, and night. You know, and, and the great thing about it is that so many of the songs we are singing our faith, right? I mean, the Christmas carols, the song you just heard. So, so many others are actually singing our faith. I'm not talking about Frosty the Snowman. I'm talking about these great carols. And so this series, these next three weeks to t- today and the next three weeks after this, are going to be built kind of around some just favorite Christmas carols that we sing every year and take for granted, of course, with the Word of God throughout the the entire series. Let me just give you the background. You obviously know the song we're talking about today is O Holy Night. And let me give you just a quick note on that song, if I may. In 1906, this is interesting, Reginald Fezzedin, 33-year-old Canadian professor, did what many people thought was impossible. And so what he did is he got in his garage, he had a generator there, because he'd been working on this for a while, had a generator there, had his makeshift generator, and plugged in a microphone. And for the very first, the very first broadcast that ever went out on the airwaves was actually Christmas Eve night. And he started the broadcast by reading from Luke chapter 2. And, and started reading the Christmas story, and you know what it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that should be taken that the whole world would be taxed. And he proceeded to read the following 14 verses. And then he did something. He took his violin, and into that microphone, he started playing this song, O Holy Night. The very first song ever played on radio or on the airways as we know it today was O Holy Night. Isn't that interesting? What a great song to Open up the airwaves with. We're going to focus on the phrase of that song. It says, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. What great lyrics. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. You know, you think about the birth of Jesus Christ when he was, it was actually at a time when, when Israel, the nation of Israel was what you might call a very weary world. I mean, they're under the oppression of Roman domination. Uh, Soldiers are marching up and down their streets. The the taxation is incredibly high, and so you can imagine the amazing poverty that was in that nation of Israel and around Jerusalem and Bethlehem and all the cities at that time. And so, so it's a very challenging, difficult, weary world at the time when Jesus Christ is born. I don't know about you guys, but I, I would just... How many kind of believe we're living in a weary world today? I just kind of think, I kind of feel in my heart, these last couple of years have been just made us weary, weary. COVID and the pandemic and all that went on. Of course, we came through some tumultuous elections and, and, the, and the racial stuff going on and the murders. They just Somebody goes into a school and kills three more teenagers or whatever it is. It's just, it's a weary, weary world. I want to tell you, into this weary world, Jesus Christ has come, and it brings hope, and it brings joy, and no matter how difficult and challenging things may be, there is always hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is always the thrill of hope, and we can rejoice even in the midst of this weary world in which we live. It was also a weary world in the Old Testament when you read about the captivity of Israel. So I want you to take your Bibles, and we're going to kind of use this scripture as the backdrop for our hope today. It's Lamentations chapter 3. You don't go there very often. I would imagine it's written by the prophet Jeremiah, who is called the weeping prophet. And then we have this short book, Lamentations and, he, and, and it's, it's a weary world in Israel because what's happened is the Babylonians have come in. They have raided Jerusalem, raided Israel. They are taking the best and brightest out. First of all, they lay siege to the city of Jerusalem for about two years. And as you study the history, uh, 18 months to two years, they, they're, they're surrounding the city. They're starving the city to death. And finally, when the city is so weakened, they attack the city, they will tear down the walls and destroy the walls of Jerusalem. They will burn the city, burn the gates, and then they will go in, not only destroy the city, but they go into the temple and totally raise the temple and destroy their center of worship. 
And then they take the very best and brightest. And of course, you know the story of Daniel and the three Hebrew children and so many others who are led back a thousand miles into captivity into Babylon under King Cyrus, King Darius, all the kings of the Babylonian Empire, and they leave the least in Jerusalem, the sick and the poor and those who cannot make the trip, those who can't make the travel. And and so Israel is a broken, scattered, devastated nation. And this is a very, the time that Jeremiah writes about, and it's a very, very weary world indeed. But somehow, God, Jeremiah realized that God's anger with Israel will not last forever because God, and we sang it earlier, is basically a good, good God and his goodness will chase after us and run after us and come after. And so he sees a day in the future when God's mercy and grace is gonna break through. The nation of Israel will be restored, but more than that, their Messiah is gonna come and he's gonna bring hope and salvation. So with that, let's look at Jeremiah chapter three, and I'll start with verse number 18. I wanna also take a moment, welcome the online campus. Man, you guys are great. Thank you for watching and tuning in today as well. Verse 18, and you kind of get a sense, you could read the whole chapter about how dismal things are. So I'll start with 18, but then you see the break occurs in Jeremiah's thinking. So I say, my splendor is gone, all that I'd hoped from the Lord. In other words, all hope is gone. The plunder of Israel is destroyed. I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them. My soul is downcast within me. Yet, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. You are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You see, those who truly seek God always have hope. I don't care how dismal things may seem in your surroundings and what you're going through, there is always hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the midst of our sorrow, we can come to God and we'll experience his mercy and his salvation. Misery threatens to overthrow, overwhelm the soul of Jeremiah, the nation of Israel, but hope always comes in, sometimes in the darkest moments, and brings the light. And that's exactly what that song is all about. The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new, a new and glorious morn. Jesus Christ was born. I want, I want to just give you about three things this morning I think that will give all of us great hope today. And the first is simply this. This new and glorious morning, first of all, brings exactly what you need. Jesus coming, Brett, exactly what you need. Look at verse 24 again. It says there, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. God is your portion, therefore God has everything you need in this life. Now, notice I didn't say everything you want because I think our wants are mixed with our own selfishness and so we kind of mix it all together. It does say God will give you the desires of your heart, but that's when our heart lines up with God's heart and then he gives us the desires, they line up with him. But it doesn't necessarily say God will give you everything you want because a lot of what we want is very, very selfish. But he will always provide your needs because he's a good father. How many many know sometimes as a good father, you don't give your kids everything you want. You would spoil them rotten. They would sometimes hurt themselves. You don't give a three-year-old, here's here's my switchblade. Take this knife and do what you want to with it. No, a, a good parent knows what your kids need and because we have a good, good father, he knows exactly what we need. And sometimes we need a test or a trial or a hardship along the way because even that strengthens our faith, right? So God's a good, good father and he is my portion and he gives me exactly what I need in this life. I I, I love this Christmas season and we're gonna get around the tree with my grandkids. I got family coming in from out of town. It's gonna be an amazing time and uh, and we're we're gonna get gifts, right? But some people get really, and if you're a kid, it's probably okay, but, but, uh, but sometimes we want and we want and we want. And so you get the gift and you shake it up and try to figure it out what it is and you get kind of drop hints all throughout the, the November and December about what you might 
get for Christmas to your spouse or whoever. And of course, if you're little, you're writing your notes to Santa Claus. But let's just take a survey real quick to see just really how much those gifts impact our life. So first of all, if you're here today, by show of hands, if you can remember two good gifts, your two best gifts you got last year, raise your hand. If it just pops the top of your head. If you remember the two very best gifts you got last year, raise your hand. Okay, 20 or so, you got great memories. Uh, how many can say, I can at least remember one gift I got last year, raise your hand. Okay, more hands went up. You got one of them right. If you're a, a man, it's probably a shirt. You're safe to, yeah, I got a shirt. I get a shirt every year. And so I got a shirt this year. And so you can remember one gift. Now, my bonus question today is if you have kids under six years of age, if any of their presents are still in one piece, raise your hand. <laughs> Don't last very long, do they, when you have kids in the house? Yeah. The, the, the idea is, and what I want to share is, things of this world, the gifts of this world, whatever age you're at, will never ever satisfy the deep longing of your heart for joy and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. He, he is the only, he is my, God's my portion. It's not my house, it's not my car, it's not my bank account, it's not my things, it's not my toys, it's not my stuff. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. God has everything we need. So before you say, Pastor, you're just a Scrooge, bah, humbug, et cetera, et cetera. I love watching my kids and my grandkids, and I love giving, and we talked a little bit that as well during this time. But one of, the only one who can satisfy is Jesus Christ. He's my portion. I, I, uh, Jeremiah, he's writing this. He's seeing the devastation of Israel. But what, what, what would prompt him to say in the middle of their devastation and poverty and captivity, what would inspire him to say, the Lord is my portion? I wonder if he didn't go back to the wilderness wanderings when the children of Israel had been delivered from Egypt and now are being brought into the promised land. They get there in a couple of years, but because of their rebellion, they're forced to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. And the Bible said that every day they would get up, especially when they're in that trip around Mount Sinai, every day they would get up and they would find manna laying all over the place. God would just drop it down from heaven. And if you don't know what manna is, no one really does. The word manna means what is that? And so what is that stuff? But it was enough to sustain them and keep them. And he tells them very specifically, I want you to go out and get that manna for your food for the day. It'll give you all the nourishment you need, but don't take too much. You take too much, others may not get theirs because you're a little faster, a little quicker on the draw, and they will go hungry. But just to show you not to take too much, and some tried to do it, the worms and maggots got into that, and it's all just messed up and ruined and stinky by the next day. The only time he says take a little extra is when the Sabbath was coming up. He says don't do any work on the Sabbath. On Friday you can catch enough for Saturday Sabbath, and I will keep that for you. But the idea is every day, every day, every morning, every time that the, the sun would come up, God would have his provision. God would have his portion there. And he says, go out and get that. Remember how Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us this day our daily bread? So what's that telling me? Every day I need the strength and sustenance that only the Lord can give. The Lord is my portion. And, and then take it a step further. Go to John chapter six, if you would. Look at verse number 27. Do not work for food that spoils. Another analogy of manna. He's gonna draw in John, Jesus in this dialogue, he's gonna draw the, what happened in Israel back into John's gospel. But the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Verse 35, I am Yahweh, the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Wow. God has everything I need for every occasion, for every day of my life. And so his glories, his blessings are new. His mercies are new every single morning. The Lord is my daily portion. He is exactly what we need in this life and has everything you need for your tomorrow. And because he's the I am God, 
He's not only the God of your right now, but he has already been in your tomorrow. He has already seen you tomorrow. And when you get there, he's gonna be there waiting for your tomorrow. And say, therefore, I don't have to be worried and afraid and anxious, right, and fearful. Because God's not only in my today, he is already in my tomorrow waiting for me because he is the I am God. Listen, we are so bound by time and days and finite thinking and finite. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the eternal God. He is always the I am God, and he is always my portion. And he'll be waiting for me when I get to tomorrow. Hallelujah. What a thought. The angels, when Jesus Christ is born, and, and they're, talk, they're talking to the shepherds, the, the heavenly host, what do they say? Peace on earth. Peace on earth. You know, people are struggling to find peace today. They're fearful. They're anxious. They're afraid. New strains coming out. What are we going to do now? Let's lock us all down again, whatever the case may be. And, and it's just this, this whole fear thing that we have lived under for the last couple years. But what Jesus Christ says, peace on earth. I got you today. I'll have you tomorrow. I'll have you the next week. So don't be afraid. Don't be so anxious. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Why? Because the Lord is my portion. He is everything I need in this life, and as long as I'm in him, he's gonna take care of me, and he's my father, he's a good God, and he knows what's best for me. Mm, mm, mm. There's a peace that knowing God will never, ever stop loving me. There's a peace in knowing that no matter what will happen, God will never leave me nor forsake me, that he is always with me, and I can stand on every promise in the word of God. There's a peace that knows he will give me strength even in my own weakness. He is my portion. Let me tell you something, church. Listen to me. He's your portion for your marriage. He is what you need to sustain and keep your marriage active and loving and thriving. The Lord is your portion. Make him the center of your house. The Lord is your portion for your children. He's your portion for your family. He's your portion for your peace and mind. He is your portion for everything you need. And when you're down and discouraged, he's already in your tomorrow. Therefore, rejoice in the Lord. A new and glorious morning is coming. Hallelujah. A new day with Christ brings exactly what you need. And then a new and glorious morning also brings hope to keep on going. Look at verse 25, if you would. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. He's my hope. And there's, you're gonna read the Christmas story with your family at some point. Some of you will sit down Christmas Eve night or maybe Christmas morning, you'll, you'll get out the gospel. Some of you may go to Matthew and read the account of the wise men coming, and that's a, an amazing part of the Christmas story. And some of you uh, more cosmic thinking people might go to John chapter one, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and then you'll get this whole idea that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and tabernacled among us. But most of us will read from Luke's gospel. Luke's is kind of the, the warm, fuzzy feeling. It kind of starts, and, and Luke's gospel kind of goes into more detail. There's more of the Christmas story in Luke than any place else. And Luke kind of builds this whole anticipation of the Messiah coming. Uh, you'll see it with Simeon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. You'll see it with Anna in the temple. Luke starts out with John's birth, John the Baptist. It's the only gospel to record the birth of John and kind of tells the whole story leading to the birth then of Jesus Christ. And then Luke kind of bears the whole reason why they're going to Bethlehem. The whole world is being taxed and you gotta return to your home city. And then you get this idea of Mary and you get the dialogue between the angels and Joseph and Mary and back and forth and said, so don't be afraid to take her as your wife because the thing that is in her has been put there by the Holy Spirit. And so go ahead, you know. And so you get this whole anticipation that Luke is building up. He's leading to that glorious morn. He's leading to the hope that is coming. Now, how many of you women in here have had babies? Let me see your hand. Okay, you know that nine months can seem like forever, but it's really not too bad until you reach that last month, right? Right? And in that last month, you are, 
excuse me, but bigger than a barn. You are a massive, and you can't see your toes anymore, and you're so uncomfortable, and your skin's been stretched out at joint, and your body's doing all these crazy changes to make way for the birth, and, and it's just this long period of time that last month can take forever, especially if your baby's late. And so they tell you, go walk or walk all day long, walk up and down, and you walk morning, noon, and night, and nothing happens, nothing changes. Can you imagine being Mary? in the very end of her pregnancy, being now finding out, you know what, guys, you gotta go back to Bethlehem. Sorry about that, but everybody's gotta go. And so they put her on a donkey and they take her 90 miles from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Can you imagine being that big, just about to give birth, riding a donkey? We're not talking an SUV here, okay? So, so that's all going on. And then you get to go through the labor and travail. Isn't that a glorious time, guys? And so it's in, and I, I, I only know because I had claws in my, sh- uh, how painful it can be in my arms and everything else. I'm looking at my wife saying, breathe, baby, breathe. <laughs> she goes, you breathe. And she grabs my arm and pulls me, my arm out of socket. And so I, it's painful for the husband too. I'm gonna tell you, if you're, especially if you're in that room. But, uh, but and then, then, the new and glorious morn, and that baby's born. And you hold that baby in your arm, and I wanna tell you, all that nine months is just a blur, and all that 24 hours of labor is just, it's gone. It doesn't mean a thing, because the baby's here. And your whole life changes, and you go from somebody who may have been looking at your past and all the other stuff that's going on, but now you look at that baby, boy or girl, and you begin to put all your hopes on that child. This child's gonna be a doctor. This child's gonna be a lawyer. This child's gonna be a president. This child's gonna be the next great basketball player, football player, whatever, whatever your passion is, you put your dreams and your hope and you cast that on that newborn baby. I want to tell you, when Jesus Christ came, the hope of mankind rested in him, was on him, a new and glorious morn. Everything else is forgotten because he's here. Our hopes all rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. The love born in Jesus Christ is so powerful that evil is broken. You imagine now when he would come and give his life for us and die on the cross, the power and hold of Satan is finally broken in humanity. That's our hope. Sinfulness, the sin that we've carried and labor with, and the Jews would try to cover up their sins year after year on those days of atonement or offering blood sacrifice after one, after another, after another. It was a bloody mess, but I want to tell you, Jesus Christ comes and he is the perfect sinless lamb of God who has given his life for the sins of the world. My hope is in Jesus Christ. Even death itself could not overcome him, and so they place him in a tomb for three days, and on the third day, he rises again, and because he lives, the Bible says, we shall live also. Church, we got hope today because that new and glorious morning, because Jesus Christ came. Listen to me. Your past really may may be really messy. It may have been hard, it may be rough, there may have been abuse, there may have been a rough childhood, there may be loss and pain and heartache along the way. Your pain may have been filled with its own labor and turmoil. And it may be dark outside, but the darkness will give way to the sun. The sun will come up and hope will rise and because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has risen today, we can know him and have that hope ourselves. Yes, the world is weary today but there is also a thrill of hope. In this weary world, we can rejoice in Jesus Christ. A new day in Christ brings the hope to keep on going, to not give up. And the third thing, a new and glorious morning brings the Savior we need. And I, want to see, I want you to see that in verse number 26 of Lamentations 3. It says, and it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And one of the, one of the things you see early in the birth story is this appearance to Joseph. And Joseph's trying to figure out about Mary being pregnant, first of all, and getting that squared away. And then, and then the angel says to him, you're going to name him. I, want to, I got his name already picked out for him. His name will be Jesus. 
Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. He will save the world from their sins. Savior. That's why the new and glorious morn is so special because he is my Savior. He takes every single sin away. You say, Pastor, why, why do we need a Savior? Why, why is that so important to us? Let me share this little illustration to you, if I may. Little boy writes a letter to Santa. The dear Santa, there are three boys living at our home. Jeffrey is two, David is four, and Norman is seven. Jeffrey's good some of the time. David's good some of the time, and Norman is good all of the time. I am Norman. <laughs> Isn't that great? He's setting Santa up. Now listen to me. Here's what I want to share with you guys. None of us are Norman. None of us are good all the time. We all struggle with sin. If, if I were to throw your thoughts you had last week on the big screen, you say, please, Pastor, don't put that up there because I got angry and I had some lustful thoughts and I had some jealous thoughts and, and, and don't put it all up there because the bottom line is we are all sinful. We all struggle in this world and we have a, a massive sin problem and therefore I need a savior. I can't save myself and I can't pay for my own sins. The Bible says in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and therefore we all need a savior. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, put it this way, all my life I've been trying to climb out of the pit of my sin, but I cannot and will not unless a hand is let down to lift me out. And so it is, God extended his hand to lift us out of our sin by doing what? Sending his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into this world to take on our flesh so he could be my sacrifice, so he could pay for my sins. It's a glorious morn because the Savior has come. Romans 3 and 23, the wages of sin is death. Only the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ could pay for my sins. That's great joy. It is no wonder this world weary with sin can rejoice. A weary world rejoices. Why? I can rejoice because every sin that I've ever done in my life, it's gone, 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 gone. Buried it in the sea, never to be dredged up again. Gone as far as the east is from the west. So far as he removed his, our transgressions from us, my sin is gone. The guilt is gone. I don't have to carry guilt around anymore. Any guilt you have now is not from the Father, it is from Satan himself. He is the accuser of the brethren because the Bible says in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The judgment and the penalty for my sin has been taken away. Why? Because Jesus Christ already took the penalty of my sin upon himself. Wow, gone. I'm adopted into his glorious family and he's placed his spirit within me that, that now I can cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, because he's redeemed me and bought me back by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and I am engrafted into the family of God. Deep joy from, comes from knowing Jesus Christ. But I wanna tell you, not just as a baby, because you, everybody's gonna get mushy at the manger, right? We all love little babies. It's such a great, touching, wonderful story. But I want you to know the Jesus of Calvary. The Jesus that the Bible says he was so disfigured and so marred we could not even recognize him. They, they plucked his beard. They put a crown of thorns in his head. head. They, the blood ran down his face. They put a spear in his side, nails in his hands and his feet. His, his back was laid open. That's the Christ you need to know. But he didn't remain on the cross. Three days later, he walked out of the tomb, conquering death, hell, and the grave. And if we'll believe in him, the Bible says we can have everlasting life. Mm. Thrill of hope that will make the weary world rejoice. The darkness of night is always followed by the sun rising. I, I, uh, my wife is a morning person. That's just her. And so her best time is that early morning hours. I'm a night person, buddy. Just, just 
You don't turn the lights out. I can go all night long. But in the morning, give me a little space. So she sees a lot more sunrises than I do. So she'll be up early in the morning, it's dark outside, and she'll sit on her back porch and have her Bible and see the sun come up. And uh, just, just so, so beautiful. I, I gotta t- tell me what it's like, baby. Just explain, describe that to me, what that experience is like. But I have caught a, a few sunrises in my day. A new and glorious morning breaks. And so maybe you're in a period of darkness right now. Maybe you're going through a rough time. I want to tell you, there's going to be a new and glorious morning, not because the sun rises, but because the Son of God is risen and seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father, and He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Let's listen to Romans 13. I'll leave you with this challenge. Romans 13 and verse number 11. And, and do this, understand the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. He says, listen, the sun's already risen. Wake up. And I'm gonna tell you, one day the sun is coming back again. And so the writer Paul says, wake up, wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. In other words, his return, his coming again is closer now than it's ever been and he is gonna come back again. And the son, the son of God is gonna return to this earth. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Listen to me. You may have been looking and searching for the answer, something to fulfill your needs, something to fulfill that longing of your heart. But I want to tell you, it's not a what you need. It's not another thing that you need. It's a who you need. And that who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the only one that can fill your life. He's the only one that can give you everlasting life. He's the only one that guarantees your future. Why? Because God is my portion. God is my hope. God is my salvation. Therefore, I will wait for him. Hallelujah.